Hello everyone, my name is Gabriel Modius and I'm Swedish Secretary General. Welcome to the, today's seminar. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you uh, at this seminar arranged by the Swedish Industrial Open Source Network, which is a network within Swedish. Uh, Swedsoft is a non-profit organization. Uh, what we do is that we work with our members from different areas of Swedish software, academy, industry and organizations to increase the competitiveness of Swedish software. We do this in some special focus areas that we got especially. Uh, they are education and how to get more people involved in Swedish software development and research, as well as the area of research and innovation. Uh, in Swedish we work with influencing collaborations and things that we do ourselves. So for in, uh, instance, uh, influencing is uh, some of the areas are about Competency Twisting Act, where people were kicked out of Sweden uh, for people that we actually needed here uh, for small errors and things. And we do reports and comment letters to government and such. We also collaborate in different forums where we engage. And we do statistics, together with Statistics Sweden, about the importance of software for Swedish companies conferences, events and such. And like I said before, we have these member driven networks such as the Industrial Open Source Network, which I know Nicholas will soon tell you a bit more about. And with that said, I hope you will all enjoy this uh, seminar today and I myself are looking forward. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me and I will tell you more about Swensoft and possibility to maybe become a member. Thank you. OK, uh, my name is Nicolas Martin Vivaldi and I'm one of the driving persons behind this industrial open source network. And we are then a network within Swedsoft. And this network is free for everyone to join, whether you're a member of Swedsoft or not, even though we of course uh, uh, let Gabriel talk uh, about the big benefits of being a member of Swedsoft that we of course strongly recommend. So this uh, network is about to share knowledge and experience around open source and um, we have had a couple of uh, uh, meetings and during the spring we, we thought of how can we get this going again even though we cannot meet. So we thought of then trying out this more virtual thing and see how th this works. So we will have today's meeting around uh, the Open Chain initiative and then next week we will have another session around software security and vulnerabilities. And today we are very happy to have uh, three uh, speakers for us. We will have uh, Shane, Jonas and Khaled giving their perspectives on, on the Open Chain initiatives. So I will not um, uh, talk more, but uh, at the end we will have a question and answer that I will, that I will handle. And then now we will let over the word to, to Shane that will kick this off. Welcome Shane. Thank you very much indeed. Now I'm looking forward to giving everyone an introduction to how the Open Chain project works. We've got a space of about 20 minutes here. Um, I don't intend to dive into details too much and we might wrap up a little bit early so we can hand over to some of the people in companies directly representing implementations of the Open Chain project. But let's get the big picture. So the Open Chain project is about trust in open source supply chains. And I'm going to share my screen to show you my slides. All right, you should be able to see that right now. So it's about trust in open source supply chains. And this is an issue which has dogged the industry for many years as we try to address the complexity of the business product pipeline uh, with the requirements of open source licenses to ensure things like attribution and similar are met. To give some context about how big this space is in terms of a challenge 
and also an opportunity, the Linux Foundation alone has got north of 1,400 member companies involved. So 80% of the Fortune 100 tech and telecom companies. We've got over 35,000 developers contributing code to over 170 open source projects. And that's just the Linux Foundation. There's a tremendous amount of activity in open source, and that means a tremendous amount of products and services, which brings a commensurate challenge in how do we manage that effectively. Uh, the Linux Foundation and other projects and organizations collaborate around the issue of compliance. In essence, when addressing open source with governance matters, we usually start at the compliance aspect. Given that this software is under copyright licenses, and these licenses explicitly state the terms of use, compliance with those terms is our key area. That's our problem space. There are many different aspects of open compliance solutions. OpenChain is way up at the top. It's uh, describing the problem space, describing the solution. So OpenChain is about defining processes. Uh, more granular, as you go further down the stack, you have things like SPDX, which is for Software Bill of Materials, something that's very important if you want to transfer code across multiple entities, whether you're manually tracking it or using automation. And then, of course, there are many options for things in automation space, tooling like Fossology for scanning. You've got Turn for containers. You have software catalogs. Um, these type of things help support the implementation of processes. OpenChain is backed by a very eclectic and wide range of companies. You can see the Platinum members here. Um, these are the companies that sit on the OpenChain board, though our overarching community now numbers in the hundreds of companies contributing and engaging worldwide. One thing that's note noteworthy is that the type of companies in the OpenChain board are as diverse as the market space utilizing open source technology. So you have companies like Toyota sitting beside Facebook because they have the same issues and the same solution spaces around open source compliance. So the OpenChain project could have approached compliance processes in one of two ways. One would be to describe in detail how you could fill out every process point. And the other would be to describe the inflection points for you should do something and then point people to reference material and give them the space to choose what's appropriate for their company and their market. OpenChain chose the latter, so it defines the key requirements of a quality open source compliance program. In other words, it defines inflection points. It says that you need to have a process in inbound to make sure what software is coming in. Internally, you need to have training and policy, and you need to have processes outbound to know what software is going out. That's an oversimplification, but in essence, that's what OpenChain does. It says you should have a process training or a policy at these points in your workflow. And then, of course, we have a large reference library that helps people discover the appropriate reference processes or policies that they can utilize when choosing their own. The idea here is that as companies adopt these key requirements throughout the supply chain, you have a very clear picture of what each company is doing. You know where they have a process implemented. And you can ask specifically with your suppliers, what are you doing at this inflection point? How are you doing this? Am I comfortable with that? This idea of having a chain of companies in the supply chain utilizing open chain is based on the observation that economics will provide a simple key driver to ensuring compliance effectiveness. In other words, the customer dealing with a the supplier, their main requirement is that compliance is good and efficient. And if something goes wrong, it can be fixed quickly. Open chain helps ensure that. So what we have with open chain is an industry standard and companies that have become open chain conformant, so they're using the standard, can use a badge to indicate that they have adopted the key requirements of a quality open source compliance program. And you can quickly know from the version of the open chain standard that they're following what precisely they're doing and how they're doing it. And this means that if you're talking to a supplier, you know exactly the right type of questions to ask them. Examples of conformant organizations are just as eclectic as our member organizations. So you have companies like Fujitsu standing beside companies like Suze, standing beside Uber and so on. Um, we have 
some very interesting uh, companies which are open chain conformant. On the bottom right of this slide, you'll see Yoma Bank, which is a, an ethical bank in Myanmar. Just yesterday, Cisco announced that they were the latest open chain conformant organization, uh, which you know increases our presence in the telecom space. But like I said, eclectic group. We've got companies in every space adopting open chain. And in some cases, or many cases, it's supplier companies, but we also have endpoint companies adopting open chain to make a clear message to their supply chain and also to increase internal efficiency. The open chain project's pretty big. Our main mailing list has got over 3,700 subscribers. Uh, we've got over 100 members on our GitHub. Areas like our global automotive and our global reference tooling work groups are well north of 100 participants each. We also have regional groups, China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, India, and Germany currently, with the UK and the US expected to spin up in the next couple of months. These work groups provide an avenue for companies to collaborate on especially areas like reference material and to help determine in their market space what's the appropriate level of compliance and what's the most effective way to not just implement compliance, but implement remediation and ensure that everything can be fixed if anything ever goes wrong. Open Chain likes to keep things simple. So our basic approach is to have a standard, which is about 12 pages long, and then there's a questionnaire to help make the standard easily digestible. Uh, this self-certification questionnaire is in the form of yes, no questions. And if a company goes through this and can answer yes to every question, uh, they know that they have the key requirements of a quality open source compliance program in place. If they go through this and answer no at any point, they know that there's a particular space that they need to put a little more emphasis on. Interestingly enough, our self-certification, which is the majority of certification methodology around our standard, our self-certification is used about 50% by companies becoming conformant and 50% by companies doing internal health checks and optimization. Naturally, as an open project, we're delighted to have both the use which we are primarily looking for, uh, conformance, and the usage in areas like general health checks and optimization, which is a great space too, and it will take people to conformance in the end. Now, to match out with processes and so on, you do need a lot of reference material, and we have that. We've got case studies from government bodies, companies. We have information from things like M&A. We have reference training slides developed by a huge audience of companies, and we've got translations globally. Our current reference library is north of 400 items included. Our latest release was a set of build instructions templates and build instruction examples because that's an area where people face a lot of challenges. Our website contains a lot of this information, especially our training slides and case studies and supplier education material. Um, the big library, the whole deal is on it. And that's where, of course, we have the material, not just place, but it's a living area and people refine documents, add to them and so on. One example is we're currently working on procurement department education, and that document has been refined most lately by PricewaterhouseCooper. OK, so OpenChain is a community of user companies working on compliance, basically looking at how we make the supply chain work. Um, and of course, we also have support from vendor companies of various sorts. So around the world, there are various companies that provide open chain related services for companies that need that. So for example, we've got law firms providing advice, providing assistance with self-certification. We've got service providers doing much the same, helping people with self-certification, in some cases doing things like independent compliance assessments to kick the tires on processes. And we do also have vendors like FOSS ID and third-party certifiers like PwC and TUVSUD. Um, as you'll quickly gather there, I mentioned self-certification, independent compliance assessment, and third-party certification. These are basically the three options of how you deal with open chain conformance. So how this works is, of course, that when there's a global entity like PwC or TUVSUD, they can come into your company and they can take you from zero to open chain conformant and they'll issue a certificate saying that they've done this and they stand by it. And, and that's kind of one end of the spectrum. So self-certification is one end where you do it yourself. Third party is the other side. And then in the middle, you've got independence compliance assessment where you do self-certification, but someone else comes in and you know, 
kicks the tires. OpenChain is spreading quite widely. We're actually in a formal standardization. We expect to be, at the moment, an ISO standard somewhere around September. I believe our final ballot is September 22nd. This, of course, will give us an ISO number, and this will provide us with an opportunity to get closer to sales and procurement departments that are outside of open source discussions, but are very aware of the inclusion of ISO standards in contracts and so on. The ISO standard of OpenChain is actually mapping exactly to our current standard, our version 2.0 of OpenChain. Uh, the ISO standard, we call it 2.1, is functionally identical. It's just reformatted in the way that ISO standards are normally formatted. So anyone who's OpenChain conformant today, like Cisco, who announced yesterday, will be ISO conformant when we finish our process around September. So as I mentioned, we've got three ways to do OpenChain. Uh, conformance, you can do self-certification, independent compliance assessment, and third-party certification. I'm not going to go into details on each of these. They're explained more fully in the slides, which I will be making available on the OpenChain site, and I believe that uh, my friends running the webinar will be doing the same. But in a nutshell, we have an industry standard, and we're providing all the different type of avenues that you need in terms of adoption. Uh, whatever your particular space is and your tolerance for um, structure and costs. The OpenChain standard has been designed by user companies and it's based purely on experience. You know, none of this is theory. This is built out of 25 years deploying products. This is where we know that there should be a process or a policy or a training. And equally so, we know that self-certification is a huge step forward. It's an effective method of reducing risk and increasing efficiency. So OpenChain is positioned as an extremely practical, low-cost methodology for optimizing open source compliance. And then we have all of that stuff with the support of uh, vendor companies who can help people if they need it. So with ISO 26262, functional safety, companies usually have something like an independent security assessment. And if they're in that space, let's say automotive, they might decide to have an independent compliance assessment with open chain. Optional, it's there. We're providing freedom of choice. Most important thing to take away is that open chain is run by user companies for user companies. Uh, everyone here is collaborating to solve an issue that affects them directly. Uh, it's purely about efficiency and optimization, and it's addressing the fact that we may have been doing open source for 25 years, but we haven't really fixed the supply chain yet. And we have to ensure that things like copyright infringement are reduced. After all, open source is fundamentally third party IP. And as with all third party IP, it needs to be respected and everyone wants to do that as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Uh, we're also looking at other areas. I was just talking with the NTIA, the uh, US government agency focused on things like telecommunications. Uh, they're interested in the security space and they're talking about how open chain can assist there. Naturally, because we're defining places where you do things like recognize packages, uh, it's equally true that knowing what the package is and the version is can help with security. So we're uh, having an active dialogue in the security space as well as the compliance space to make sure that open chain fits alongside other standards and that we all reference each other as effectively as possible. That's it. The last part of my message is that we'd like you to be part of the community. Everyone is welcome. Any organization, whether for-profit, non-profit, uh, you're very welcome to join in. Uh, you can access our certification and do a self-certifier health check. It's completely free and of course it's private unless you decide to make your results public. And we're a very open community. We have bi-weekly webinars. We have bi-weekly discussions on things like editing the standard and other items and we have mailing lists all over the world. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing the other presenters. Okay, thank you, Shane, and um, we'll see what questions pop up at the end. Um, and now we will hand over to uh, Jonas Öberg, who is the Open Source Officer at Scania. Welcome, Jonas. Thank you. Um, right. Um, Open source of Scania. So let me tell you a little bit about the experience that we had uh, when we started looking at Open Chain um, a few years ago now. Um, now let me start by saying that uh, if my slides work, there we go. 
Uh, well, you know Scania. Obviously, I don't need to present Scania to you. Uh, we make trucks, buses, engines, and, and services for a sustainable transport solution system. Um, but let's be honest. You've probably never seen any open source released from Scania. We have a long history of, of using open source in, in services and in our products, but we're still very much beginners when it comes to contributing to open source. The guidelines that help our employees contribute to open source were approved just in October of 2019, so um, about a half a year ago, a bit more. Um, this means, of course, that we're also fairly new to open chain in a relative sense. When we started building our open source activities in around 2018, uh, we looked at open chain and the first thing we realized is that as an OEM, open chain is not a requirement that is placed on us by any of our customers. We don't have anyone buying a truck from us saying, are you open chain compliant? Maybe they should, but they're not actively doing that. However, open chain is a standard that we would very much want to see our suppliers live up to. When we go up and we procure solutions that we're gonna place in a truck or in our services, we would like to ensure that when that software includes open source, which it usually does today, that the company that we're buying from have reasonable practices in place, reasonable processes that ensure that we on our side can meet the license obligations related to open source and our turn. An open chain gives the tools and the processes and the way of communicating this in a very easy way. So if you look at the sourcing requirements that we have and that we're starting to, to roll out towards our suppliers uh, when we come to, to new procurement agreements, uh, we say that to ensure license compliance in the supply chain, the supplier should be able to show that they have an internal open source compliant program which controls the intake, use and distribution of open source software and that this can be shown through open chain conformance version 1.2 or higher or through the appropriate to seat certification. So that's what Shane was talking about before and giving it a name as will happen now with open chain as an ISO standard as well will simplify this even further than making something open chain conformant is no different than living up to any other ISO standard, most of which we, or many of which we already have requirements on, on our suppliers. But as I said, if you step back one second and say that, okay, as no OEM, open chain is not a requirement as placed on us. No one is telling us to live up to, to open chain requirements. So is it then relevant or is it only from a sourcing perspective? Do we only need to put in a put it in a in a procurement document and, and then we're done? Is that the end of the open chain story? Well, obviously not. I have a few more minutes uh, to share with you. And that then goes into what Shane was talking about, a health check. When we looked at open chain and we started to build and imagine what the Scania's open source program would look like, I essentially looked through the requirements that OpenChain placed on us. For instance, OpenChain mandated that we should have a documented FOSS policy for an open source software. That makes sense. And I also wanted that the Scania open source program include an open source policy. That almost goes without saying. Um, now, the, the open chain conformance checklist also said that we should have FOSS training materials covering open chain and, and other parts of, of open source learning. Um, and of course, I wanted my open source program at Scania to include training for the developers that are going to use and contribute to open source. Open chain said that we not wanted a documented procedure for identifying and tracking uh, FOSS components as they went through the company. And again, yes, that makes sense because indeed, when I think about an open source program, I imagine also process tooling and help for the developers to keep track of the open source that they're using. As well as a document of FOSS contribution policy was also a requirement. And of course, we want the compliance process and, and the guidelines appropriate for that. So when you started to go through the open chain conformance checklist and you start realizing that well actually many of the topics that are raised if not all of them in open chain 
are things that we would really much want to have within the open source program at Scania. So there's perhaps limited surprise when I say that um, the Scania open source program consists of open source training, uh, policies, compliance and process guidance and process tooling. Um, essentially the part that we lift straight out of open chain, things that were required from open chain. Uh, they helped form the basis of our open source program. They all made sense. This is what was needed from an industry perspective to keep track of open source, to know your legal obligations. So we used that as a template to build our open source program and as a health check them on a regular basis to look at our policies, look at our processes and review them against the open chain conformance checklists. Another aspect which was almost equally as important is and this is a consequence of the fact that when you open open chain when you start reading the the conformance checklist when you start reading the documents um, you can essentially unwrap an open source program from that documentation that also means that the open chain portfolio is very easy to bring around to different places in the organization it doesn't matter so much where you anchor this where you place it at Scania at the moment, we have the open source program anchored in the IT organization. We work heavily with research and development. We work heavily with sales and marketing, but it doesn't matter so much where we have it technically. We could have taken this portfolio, open chain and then our open source program and anchored it in purchasing or at sales and marketing or at production and logistics. And anywhere you anchor this, anywhere you place this portfolio, anywhere you give responsibility for this portfolio, once they open it, once they start reading the open chain documents that are part of this portfolio, it will unwrap and it will generate an open source program that looks maybe slightly different, but roughly equivalent regardless of where you anchor it in the organization. That was important for us as well, because we were not certain that it actually belongs at IT. Now, it makes sense that this is there, um, but it could also move in the future. It could move to R&D if that becomes more relevant as an example, but the portfolio stays roughly the same regardless of where you bring it. So from open chain, we got a wide number of things. Um, we didn't just get uh, an ISO standard or the embryo of an ISO standard that we could ask our suppliers to, to live up to. Uh, that was just one part of three that we got from open chain open source sourcing requirements okay fine that's what we thought we would get from the beginning and that's what we got um, and that's what we're starting to roll out but we also got our entire open source program now of course it's developed a little bit since then it's not only open chain but open chain really forms the embryo of the open source program that we have in place today um, and that was really the starting point uh, for most of our activities and we get the portfolio we package up the open source program anchor it in open chain and then we can bring it around to to any place within the organization um, all three of those uh, the portfolio the program and sourcing requirements are all extremely important for us so we're very happy that open chain was able to actually live up to the promise of delivering on all of these three aspects. Um, it really helped tremendously in getting things from essentially zero to almost 100 um, in, the, in the span of a few months. Made very quick progress at that point. Now, the question you're asking, of course, is and are we going to see autonomous trucks running open source anytime soon? Um, and no, the answer is unfortunately not. Um, to some extent, yes, they are. Um, this is the Scania AXL, uh, which is a fully autonomous concept truck. Um, and yes, this is running open source, but it's not doing it in a public road. Um, so sorry, Chain. Uh, open chain doesn't solve all of our problems. Um, we have other challenges that we want to meet as an industry as well. Um, I'll just mention one of them, which is that we need to have confidence in software. Now, we, we all know that software isn't perfect. We've all seen the blue screen of death, the kernel panic, a guru meditation if you've been long enough. Um, and this is typically not what you want to happen when you press the, the stop pedal in front of a, in front of a red light. Um, it's not something new 
we've been here before. Uh, we do have software that just must work within the space industry, aeronautics, healthcare, etc. Uh, but as more and more of our environments is controlled by software, the safety of that software becomes more important. Uh, software is in control of systems that have failure modes that can actually lead to permanent injuries, fatal injuries, people can die. Um, it's quite possible to build safety critical systems with open source, of course, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, it's just that we're not used to doing so yet. But our ability to address that challenge of actually putting open source into new places, putting open source in charge of even more critical infrastructures, that is a challenge that we are happily meeting only because we have already solved the licensing issues, the underlying, the fundamentals of open source, the things that we just must have in place in order to progress. Now that we have that, we have the open source program, we have open chain, we have the sourcing requirements, we have everything that goes with it. Now we can approach the other areas as well. We couldn't have gone there before doing the open source program. We needed somewhere to start. So open chain was the embryo that kickstarted everything um, and that enabled us today now to then really meet the, the, the challenges of creating sustainable transport solutions using open source software. So I'm going to end and head over to, to our next presenter um, with Shane's favorite slide here, uh, which is my message to all of you here. That is to start your journey with open chain and enjoy the ride because you never know what challenges you're going to be able to meet once you have done the open chain certification to start with. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Um, let's move over to our third presenter, who is then uh, Kaleri Mods. Uh, Kale is uh, a consultant at Adelot, but will talk about uh, his experiences being an open source officer at uh, Sony Mobile. So welcome, Kalle. Uh, well, I'll start presenting about uh, my time in Sony Mobile and how we came to love open chain. Uh, just a short note of my background. Um, my career has been on telecom and mobile software engineering. I joined Sony Ericsson, that is now Sony Mobile in 2004 was appointed to a software strategist and quite quickly I get an um, open source in my lap and I had to take care about driving through open source throughout the whole entire company. Uh, I then was the head of open source for more than a decade, um, building up the open source program of Sony Mobile. Um, I've been involved in research, looking into different aspects of open source governance. And I left the company last year and joined in my former research partner, Adlot. But that's about me. Um, I usually start giving a background of what happened with Sony Mobile from the early years and how we switched it over to a smartphone and open source. So the history of Sony Mobile is that we had the GSM phones building our own operating system, OSC. We also had a Symbian operating system. We did have Microsoft and some entry level operating systems. But the signs were there that something would happen in 2007 and 8. And we started with an open source strategy. Uh, we seen that there would be a drastic changes in the marketplace. And they went really drastic because already the following year, we closed down our own operating system. We turned it over to Symbian that became open source and then Android. And from 2011 forward, we was only Android. To need to do this transformation, I had an open source maturity model. Uh, and I'm going to just briefly mention that one. Uh, this is something I used internally in the company to explain the road ahead what kind of stages we needed to go forward in terms to getting us to in good shape with working with open source. <clears throat> um, briefly, uh, starting with um, getting in processes, uh, policies, 
different kind of uh, tools, of course, and then, of course, providing lots of training about the open source culture and trying to drive through the culture change that is necessary to really be achieving an open source. And then that's on the third level, then you're active and contributing and you're really part of the communities. <clears throat> Going forward, you can start to create an open source platform, inviting partners, and then the focus of your open source program will be more shifted to developing business models around the open source offering. But going back to the timeline and explain a little bit more in detail what happened. So um, I brought the strategy in 2008. We started to prototype with Android. We started to develop policies, organization, and roles. 2009, uh, the policies were formally approved by the top management. Uh, created the open source program and the open source board that was instrumental for driving the work forward. And we actually shifted over to an Android product development. And first of that, it was necessary to have an, op an open source based tool chain for developing Android. Then from 2010, it was on the open source based operating systems for our handsets. We launched the first Android handset in March 2010. We had a, a incorporated an open source auditing tool doing the open source compliance checks. And we, I conducted a live training for 250 plus managers and key personnel. 2011, our works, we only worked with Android. So then I had to scale up the whole thing uh, even further. I developed a web course and that was launched for 3,500 developers. We started to gear up the contributions to the Android Open Source Project. Um, we had to also scale up the compliance work as we are releasing more and more handsets in Android. Um, you could say that in 2012, we have finally reached some kind of culture shift within the company. Um, open source was now widely spread and used. Uh, we started to get the recognition from Google for our contributions on Android, and also that the, the free developer world, uh, the XA developers, recognizes on a mobile as the top OM of the year. Um, I'll show you briefly that. Uh, 2014 was kind of a hallmark year because then we did an internal assessment of our open source governance. So you can say it took six years to end up in a very good shape. Or so we thought. So this is just a note that we get from the Exodus developers. Um, we were seen as a very good community members on open source, and that was a, a great, great recognition. And the assessment we did in 2014 showed that we have achieved the goals of reaching at least level four, level three, and on some parts level four. Um, great work. Everything looks very fine indeed, but was it really? Well, uh, not really. There is something that we have done here is to getting our house in good shape, but we have a challenge and that is the suppliers. On positive notes from the suppliers was that when the launch of Android, they quickly see the, <clears throat> the opportunity to uh, shift to open source for their deliverables. Uh, if you're developing hardware and the company software, like software drivers or um, frameworks, uh, it, they quickly realized it was more convenient to release this as open source licenses. And then the maintenance will, burden will be relying on us instead. Though, uh, although we had a um, lot of obligations mentioned in agreements, and we issued specific instructions how to handle open source. That was not enough to foster our suppliers to provide a good open source compliance of their deliveries. Uh, quite often they could uh, deliver a Linux, but not necessarily the Linux version that we got. So they provide us with a source code, but not the right version. And they really didn't understand that they need to really fully comply to, to the requirements that they have to be the same 
the Miss version as we were using. And then an additional headache is when you're switching suppliers, and that happens over the course of years. Uh, you're taking new hardware, uh, and you're getting a new bunch of software that doesn't really comply to uh, open source uh, compliance requirements. So um, we had an issue with our suppliers. Oh, that didn't matter really that we had with our own house in good shape, but the suppliers were not really up on par in, in open source compliance. Adding to all this is a court case that was um, made in 2013 that made it very clear that we as an original equipment manufacturer had the ultimate responsibility for the open source compliance. So we couldn't pass it backwards to the suppliers. So if something was wrong, we had to do the compliance work for sure, all of us ourselves. Uh, and that added cost, we had to really work through the compliance work ourselves. And of course, with that also some legal risks. So that was a really headache, but We had something really active coming up here, and that comes the Open Chain Initiative. So, Sony Corporation started to follow the Open Chain project from the early days in 2014. And we saw it as a really attractive core idea of leading by example, by raising the bar by self imposed certification. That is, you, you're putting yourself in good shape, and then you prove it for your suppliers. Well, we live up to this standard. How about you? You could uh, softly pursue them, them to uh, starting to uh, behave themselves better. And then you also had some kind of a stick that if this is going to be a standard uh, in the industry, and you will lose out as customers and others if you don't start to improve your um, compliance work and, and deliver good deliverables that are open source compliant. So we started to, with the Open Chain initiative as a background. We started to open up the dialogue with our key suppliers, and it slowly worked that we started to get an interest to collaborate, for instance, in open source compliance tools on other practices. And uh, first of all, uh, we had some kind of common language in them understanding what was the requirement. Uh, in 2017, we decided to go the full way. Um, we did our own open chain uh, assessment. We uh, aimed to get them straight for certification and uh, declare us conformant to the 1.1 specification. Um, as we had a rather good program already in place, we found out that most of the things were since long implemented, but uh, we had some formal flaws. Uh, we couldn't really ensure everything. Uh, so we found out that uh, some points really needed some improvements as well. So it was great to follow the specification to shape and up our own program. And then in October 2017, the Sonar Corporation became a platinum member of Open Chain, and that really raised the stakes. Uh, then we really get to, uh, the attention with uh, the key suppliers. So, uh, yes, a summary the key takeaways on our open chain experience is that uh, if you don't have an open source program in place, like Scania that started uh, from scratch, then open chain is a great foundation for building a robust open source program. Really recommend that. But even if you have a open source program since long, then Open Chain is very great for shaping up the quality of your program. Uh, there's always things that could be improved or relaunched and, and getting out the message again and sharp, shaping up the whole organization. And then is, of course, the great benefit of. Uh, the, the approach of open chain that speaks of the encourage a big stick approach. That is that you, you invite your suppliers to collaborate on the issue of open source compliance. 
And fourthly, and not least, um, the collaborative nature of the Open Chain Project by itself opens up channels for industry collaborations. And that was maybe something that we didn't realize in the beginning, but that is actually a great way to have an open up discussion with the industry. Um, sometimes we are the suppliers to someone else, and we work or work collectively for a better good. And we also noted that there are specific um, regional industry collaborations. You have the Open Chain Automotive, Open Chain Japan, Open Chain Germany, the Tool and Working Group, and some others. And that leads me to conclude my presentation with maybe a question for the Q&A. Is it maybe time for an open chain audit? With that, um, I would like to thank you for my presentation. Thank you, Kalle. And uh, we have now um, a little, a little slot here for, for questions and answers. So just if you have questions, just write them in and I will uh, uh, direct them to the to all or to a specific uh, uh, speaker. So I can start while we wait for the questions. Shane, a little bit back to Kalle's questions on, on uh, geography. Um, as I understand, there has been a lot of uh, movement in, in in Asia when it comes to, to, to the open chain. And as I understand, you have started open chain Germany now. So is, is that, can you give us a little bit uh, on, 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 on that spread and where you on, of course. A, on, a, on, a Nord, on a Nordics angle on it as well, please. <laughs> okay, so we a few years ago saw quite a lot of collaboration in Silicon Valley uh, through, and this was referenced by Carl, uh, the To Do Group. And that was companies like Twitter, Google, Facebook getting together and sharing notes on their OSPOs. So companies like Google and Facebook are primarily advertising driven but make a huge amount of open source code. And they utilize a huge amount of third party code. And of course, they want to make sure their supply chains are neat and tidy. So these companies began to share notes and it became the To Do Project. And it, in essence, it provided a cross institutional knowledge base, which was very useful. In areas like Japan or areas like China, companies have been much more in silos traditionally. And while we did have things like legal study groups running for the last eight or nine years, the study groups were quite passive, taking information and taking it back to a company. In the last two years or so, we've seen a, a sea change as companies uh, essentially move to the point where management understands open source compliance knowledge is not a differentiator. It's, it's not a selling point. It's an essential. So companies are sharing notes now in ways they didn't previously. Uh, the Japanese company started it actually a long time ago, about five years ago. A gentleman called Kato-san from Panasonic got up on stage and said, I'm going to talk about a company. Not my company, of course, but a company. And here's the story of what went right and what went wrong. And that kind of started the dialogue. So yeah, I mean, we've basically seen companies across the globe increasingly understand that open source compliance is, first of all, not a a product, it's not a differentiator, but it is a requirement and companies can accelerate a great deal by sharing notes. Open chain itself is a consequence of this. I mean, everyone is trying to solve for the supply chain and if we have a common solution that works best. So we spent a few years drafting the most effective cross market solution possible. Uh, Germany is tremendously active in open source. Companies like Siemens, Bosch are global leaders for many, many years. What has happened in Germany is that we've reached a certain tipping point where many companies, whether you're looking at BMW, Daimler, whether you're looking at industrial giants, everyone's using open source. And uh, same as in Japan, people are very aware that they can save time by working together. So it's an organic, organic thing. The reason is simple. And uh, it's something that spreads around the world depending on open source maturity. I know that in, for instance, Finland, Sweden, there's a great deal of open source knowledge. And there's already quite a lot of uh, sharing, I believe, between companies. I mean, for example, Jonas's presentation is a key example of this, an automotive company talking about how they do stuff. Uh, but I, I think increasingly you'll find local work groups to share business process knowledge will be uh, increasingly common. OK, thank you, Shane. Uh, a question for, for Jonas. Um, uh, well, the OEM have been um, 
security requirements on uh, ISO, ASPIs, 26262, and also then done in the initial phases, they were also involved in supporting and actually doing follow-up and evaluation. Do you foresee any of this happening for, for in your case, that you will support, follow-up, evaluate, or will you let the suppliers drive it more like a, a self-assessment activity? Um, yes, good question. Um, we haven't actually had to do a lot of training on our suppliers. Um, when we show them open chain, when we start talking to them about open source compliance, um, we recognize today, maybe slightly more than five, ten years ago, that there's a, an increased awareness from the suppliers that this is something that they need to actually look at. Um, they do have the capacity to address it. Um, it's just sometimes that we're a bit the first ones that are actually asking these questions and, and making these requirements on them. Um, so I would say in some ways it's a little pent up demand um, for expertise around this question as well, which is now starting to be unlocked. Uh, but by and large, the suppliers know what they need to do. Um, they might not have the resource or the, um, the capacity themselves to do it, um, but they know where to get support. Uh, we usually don't need to, to direct them somewhere. Okay, thank you. And uh, a follow-up question is then for Kalle on a little bit the same theme. Um, did you, what did you do uh, more specific with your suppliers at Sony? Did you do evaluations or how, how did you, did you do any act active follow-up of, of what they, if they changed behavior during your open source journey? Yeah, I mean, in, in the other days we had, um, we, we tried to do by our agreements and legal obligations that we had in contracts with their suppliers. To, to make them to shape up. And sometimes we have what we call um, ODMs, or regional design manufacturers, that is suppliers that have supplied a full handset to us on our specifications. And we had to pay for the, the compliance tools and, and training on compliance for them. Um, on when open chain entered, then it was much more easy to just to point out this is a program, try to adopt this, um, and come back to us and report what you are doing. And, uh, and as we were open up with something, what we were doing, it was not a big issue. So um, I would say that it, it shifted from the early days when we tried to do it through our legal action to the later days when this was more an open source program to open source program interaction that worked better in uh, the later years. Okay, I think that was the questions here. Um, before we then end, I just want also to remind about next week, we will have a, a new um, webinar with uh, uh, a little different angle then, we're talking about software vulnerabilities and uh, or software security vulnerabilities, particularly then when it comes to, to open source. So uh, I wish you all welcome and um, we will, um, if te the technology is with us, we will publish this uh, through Swedsoft so that you can spread this uh, among your colleagues and friends that you think uh, should be interested in uh, open source and in the open chain. So with this we will end this webinar and if you have any questions uh, we will have the contact details to the speakers in, in, in the in the handout. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank Shane, Jonas and Kalle for, for, your, for your talks and uh, they'll Good luck with the uh, continued open source journey then. Okay, thank you all.